Well, thank you, Al. That was that was wonderful, very generous, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to thank all the sponsors of this event, but I want to especially thank Al. Uh, uh, the, the, the secret is he's why I'm here. And that's partly because of uh, who Enbridge is and what they're doing, but it's also because of his personal leadership and uh, uh, leadership in the true sense of the word as a CEO. And I have the privilege of working with a lot of CEOs around the world, and, and Al is, is uh, at the top of the list. So thank you, Al, for bringing me here. I also want to congratulate the, uh, this Board of Trade. Wow. Didn't, didn't, didn't know this was happening. Uh, we went from kind of an old British logo to the future. Uh, and I think you're, you're locked on to the idea that actually the region now is the core unit of competitiveness. You know, not the city or the town or the suburb uh, or any other piece. It's, it's the whole that regions have to learn how to think strategically. They have to compete. Uh, they have to do that by improving their business environment. I've seen a little bit of the work of the Board of Trade on competitiveness, on clusters, and some of the work you're doing on thinking about the region. I think it's, I think it's great work. So uh, yeah, we could spend this entire session on that topic. But uh, as Al said, um, um, I'm, I'm here uh, today uh, to talk about um, a subject that's relatively new to me, uh, which is the subject of energy. Uh, I've had a history of working on the environment and a deep interest in environmental issues, um, but really had never had an opportunity to, to think about energy and this nexus of energy in the environment and where we are, you know, in the global economy uh, and, uh, and, and how we're challenging this whole new order of issue that we haven't really had to think about really in all of history, which is this whole issue of the climate. Um, and and what, what that means, and how we navigate our way through this, um, through this very complex transition that I think is underway, but is going to take many years uh, uh, to accomplish. Now, uh, what I'd like to do today, and we have a, you know, limited time, but what I'd like to do today is, is tell you a story. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about economic opportunity um, and improving economic opportunity. I'd like to tell a story about energy. Energy is the fuel for prosperity in the world. Uh, we can't have prosperity and economic opportunity without energy, or at least we haven't figured out a way yet. Um, and I'd also like to tell a story that's about the environment, um, which uh, I think is not something that we can treat in a separate bucket, but we have to start to see how economic opportunity and energy and the environment you know, come together in what is undoubtedly a historic transformation in the energy utilization of the world. Um, this transition to clean energy. Uh, this transition that we know we have to make. And this transition that uh, uh, is creating lots and lots of challenges and lots and lots of dialogue and discussion all around the world. Uh, and Canada is, is certainly no exception. But I'm going to focus primarily in this story about the United States. Uh, I got interested in this work and, and, and started down this path really because of what we see happening in the United States. So I'd like to tell you a story about the United States and how we're dealing with this energy transformation. Um, and uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, I, I, I'm telling you this story because I think it's hopefully an interesting story and it's instructive about concepts and ideas. But the real reason I'm telling you this story is that I'd like you all to consider what Canada's story is going to be. I'm, I'm going to tell you the US's story. I've been sort of in the middle of it, living it, but, but I real, the real question for today, I think, is what's Canada's story? Canada's on this path. Canada's making this transformation. 
Uh, Canada is struggling and grappling with a whole variety of issues and choices and challenges and obstacles and, uh, and, and complex questions in making this challenge. And hopefully, uh, by talking a little bit about the U.S. Uh, story, we can shed some light on uh, what Canada needs to do. Uh, so that's what I'd like to, to do today. Um, this work uh, that I'm going to be talking about was work that was done jointly uh, with uh, a very, very talented team of people from the Boston Consulting Group, uh, where HBS and BCG, on a really a pro bono basis, came together uh, to jointly take a look at this uh, very, very important issue. I'll talk a little bit about why we did that in a moment. Uh, I want to recognize Greg Pope, who's sitting right here in the front row on right there, uh, as one of the core co-authors of this study and tremendous driver of this work, a uh, remarkable, talented uh, young uh, man. Uh, I welcome all of you to get to know Greg uh, if you get a chance. Uh, we also had, uh, uh, we also engaged people from all sectors, all stakeholders in this work uh, over a year or year and a half period. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is clearly a joint effort. Uh, but uh, this was a, a question and a topic that proved to be irresistible. Uh, one that we really had to confront. And uh, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, about that as well. Now, why did we undertake this work? Well, it's all started uh, with some other work that began at Harvard Business School in, in 2011, um, uh, where the school took on what we call the US Competitiveness Project. And it's something we'd never done before as an institution. We really took on the work of trying to figure out what was happening to the US economy. We were seeing very disturbing trends and very uh, unsettling uh, data about the progress and evolution of the American economy. And uh, we set out as an institution to kind of try to understand what was going on as a matter of our responsibility uh, as an institution to our, our, our home country, uh, the United States. Um, we were very, very interested in trying to figure out what's going on here. Why are we seeing things we haven't seen in generations happening in America? You know, what are the causes? Is this just a cyclical thing driven by the Great Recession? Um, and based on our diagnosis, what should we do? So we set out to uh, look, at, look, at, look at the data and try to figure out uh, the answers to these very complicated questions. And what we saw was a lot of data like this. This is data on the median household income uh, uh, in America, the median, you know, kind of the, in the middle of our American families, and uh, look at what a break in a long-term trend line has happened to us. Um, it dates back to before the Great Recession. The turning point on this metric really was 1999. Uh, after decades of sort of ups and downs, but a movement in the positive direction, median family uh, uh, household income started going down. And although there's been a little bit of a bump here and there since, uh, it's still going down. What's going on? The American dream is, is premised on the idea that uh, the median family income of the next generation is going to be higher than the one before. So this was a very, very unsettling uh, trend. We, we saw a lot of other data like this. This is data on job creation in the American economy. And what we saw was around the same time, 1998, 1999, 2000, the job generation engine of the United States of America started sputtering. Uh, it started, there started to be new, fewer new jobs generated every year. And of course, when the Great Recession hit, that really spiked you know, in the downward direction. But more, more important even than that was the nature of the jobs that were being created in our economy. Uh, this slide shows you that when you look at an economy, there are really two kinds of businesses in an economy. There are traded businesses that really compete with other locations, with other countries, and there are local 
industries or local businesses that are primarily, if not exclusively, serving the local need, the local demand of the people living in a particular geographic area. And what we discovered that uh, was that for about the last two decades, all, all, A-L-L, -L, all of the new jobs, net new jobs generated in the American economy were local jobs, not traded jobs. We were no longer competitive enough to be able to grow the jobs in businesses that actually had to compete internationally. Those jobs were moving elsewhere. Uh, stunning, uh, if you think about the historical evolution of the US and, and wh where we've traditionally been. There are many more data like this on a whole bunch of other metrics. Economic growth rates have slowed down steadily over the last 20 years. Productivity growth, which we know drives economic growth, has slowed down steadily over the last 10 or 15 years. Something profoundly different has started to happen in the American economy that we got very, very concerned about. As we did the diagnosis, what we came to understand was that the fundamental competitiveness of the US has been allowed to erode. We have not kept up in, in our country on skills. We have not kept up on education. We have not kept up on infrastructure. We have not kept up on uh, having an efficient regulatory environment. We have not kept up uh, on having a responsible budget that uh, is sustainable uh, for our uh, country and for uh, many of our states. Uh, this was what we came to believe is this is a fundamental competitiveness problem. And, um, and, and, and out of that, we came to the, uh, came to the uh, point of saying, what should we do? And, um, and, and, and as, as, we, as we thought about that, we also started to see another uh, related issue, which was divergence. Uh, people with skill in America were doing well. Larger companies were doing well. People with just medium skill, good solid education, weren't doing well or worse. Uh, small business, which was the bedrock of, of US kind of vitality and growth and job growth, was sputtering. There are more small businesses dying today in America than being created in America. This had never happened as far back as we had the data. Uh, again, as we looked at the root causes of this, it was fundamentally a competitiveness problem. Uh, the big companies and the people with high skill could take advantage of America's strengths, our innovation, our entrepreneurship. And the weaknesses that we had built in America for a big company were no problem. They just invested somewhere else. But the average worker with the average education uh, or the small business is kind of stuck with the weaknesses that we had allowed to create in America. Uh, there was no place to go. And, and those, those folks in our society have, have been struggling. Again, a stunning change in things that had been sort of axioms of what America is all about and what the American economy is all about. So you can see why we were so concerned. So we, we set out to develop a, a strategy, a plan for what to do. Uh, and I kind of, as I think back to that you know, effort to create a strategy for America, uh, just think about the presidential election that's going on in our country right now. Think about the disconnect between a strategy for America and that, and that presidential election. But, any, but anyway, we, we, we came out with, uh, we, we, we developed this plan. And these seven things that you see on this, on, this, uh, on this slide were things that Washington needed to do. There are lots of things that needed to happen at the state and regional level, but Washington needed to tackle some of the big issues, our tax code, our, uh, our uh, immigration system, uh, uh, in, in many of these areas, Canada has actually done some really great work. Uh, I'm very jealous of the whole immigration environment here in Canada. I think it's very, very well done and, and very pro-competitive. Uh, you know, we're still, you know, nowhere on these issues. So we identified all these uh, things to do. We actually tested these, and it turned out that everybody agreed with them. Everybody. I mean, almost literally everybody. 
We poll the general public. We poll the business community. High, huge, overwhelming majorities of people said, yeah, these are all the things we need to do. But guess what? In the last 20 years, we haven't done any of them. Not even one. We've made no progress, really, on the tax system. We've made no progress on the budget, no progress on immigration, no progress on uh, uh, infrastructure, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's the context in which we, uh, we also identified one overwhelming opportunity for America. And you're all probably guessing what that was. And the answer was energy. America was hit by a bolt of lightning. Starting in 2005, out of nowhere, we developed a profound competitive advantage in energy. Because of these new unconventional, and my, that word I mean the tight oil, the shale oil and gas, that technology had found a way to unlock. Not just unlock sort of on the margin, but unlock in a way that was highly competitive, highly efficient. Um, and uh, this was clearly then America's big opportunity. We had all these problems. We were struggling dealing with these problems, but we had this big opportunity, and this big opportunity was sort of happening. And the question was, how do we really seize this opportunity from a strategy point of view uh, for our country? Uh, but what we came to the conclusion of is, is that we were at serious risk of, of, of actually missing this opportunity. Uh, and the reason was that the nature of the dialogue we were having as a nation about this issue was so unproductive and so unhelpful and so divisive that there was a good chance that we would just come to a grinding halt on taking advantage of this opportunity. So we set out to do a very, very deep body of work on this energy issue, uh, how to think about it, uh, uh, you know, what, what the, our, our best understanding of was how this issue would evolve over time and, and ultimately, again, what we should do, what we should do. Now, let me say here just uh, in passing that actually Canada is the one other country in the world that actually has the same opportunity. Uh, because Canada is very well endowed with uh, this unconventional uh, energy resource. And besides the United States, Canada is the only other country in the world that has significantly mastered and mobilized the technology to actually develop this resource. Uh, I, think, I think there's 120,000 or 30,000 wells where they used to be in, in North America. Uh, you know, more, the majority are U.S., the, the smaller number is Canadian, but after U.S. and Canada, the next guy on the list is, is almost at nowhere. And what's happened is that the downturn in energy prices has pretty much brought all the other activity in the world that uh, used to, that was, there was a lot of talk about unconventional development in China and places like that. That's all stopped. Come to a screeching halt. So it's quite clear that this energy opportunity is going to potentially be present for a long, long time. The question is, can we take advantage of it? Uh, and that's what we, uh, I and, and BCG and our, and our whole team was, was deeply, deeply concerned about. So let's talk a little bit about this opportunity. The nature of the dialogue and the policy and environment and the business community uh, uh, approach uh, to developing this issue um, and, um, and, and then talk a little bit about you know, kind of where we go from here. And once again, I'm going to tell you the U.S. story, uh, partly because I want to tell you the U.S. story, but partly because I want to ask you the question, what story do you want to happen in this country? You know, how, how is this going to play out here? What path should you be on? How do you get on the right path? What's the right way to think about this in business? 
in, in the hydrocarbon producer world, among environmentalists, among the, the, the kind of average Canadian citizen, how do, we, how do we approach this? How are you approaching it in Canada? How should you approach it in Canada? That's, that's what this story is ultimately uh, all about here today. Now, the nature of the U.S. energy advantage that emerged is, I think, probably relatively well known to many of you. Uh, because of the tremendous technological innovations, um, the U.S. now has a quantity of resource availability in terms of the, this uh, co unconventional resource. And the technology to extract this resource at very, very competitive cost. That was already the case, but this downturn uh, that we're now living through has ironically just widened the advantage. The rate of innovation going on right now in efficiency and effectiveness in, in extracting the resource at low cost is just breathtaking. You know, some of it is just beating up on the suppliers, but, but a lot of it is fundamental stuff, using less water, uh, doing it more efficiently, uh, you know, having multiple wells driven off the same pad, uh, drilled off the same pad, rather than having multiple pads spread all over the place. Uh, this energy advantage uh, is, uh, gives the U.S. a substantial advantage in uh, feedstock cost, natural gas prices. Right now, prices are really low. Those prices are testing the limits you know, of the cost position, uh, but uh, the cost position is going down. Uh, the U.S. now has a substantial advantage uh, compared to uh, everybody except potentially Canada in electricity prices. Our electricity prices, and the data is changing all the time, but our electricity prices are roughly half of the other major industrial economies that we've traditionally competed with. Again, there's a pause right now. Uh, there, there's retrenchment right now because of the, the price swings. But make no mistake, this is an epic competitive advantage that will be sustainable for the foreseeable future. There's so much resource here, it's about for the foreseeable future. Okay? This was a bolt of lightning that hit the U.S. There was, there, was no, there was no national policy or strategy. It was the private sector. It was a bunch of entrepreneurs. It was, it was great, you know, great technology that, that got this to happen. Enormous potential advantage. Quite sustainable. And again, Canada can have the same advantage uh, if it chooses to uh, pursue this opportunity uh, aggressively. We'll come back to that later. The benefits of uh, this energy advantage for America, this precious energy advantage at a time when we were facing so many other weaknesses, uh, has been already substantial in terms of, of GDP per capita, uh, in terms of jobs. Uh, we, we estimate that well over half of the jobs that were created after the you know, Great Recession were because of this. Not necessarily just in the production, but also in all the spillover and connected activity in regions around the country and infrastructure and transportation and all that kind of stuff. The jobs that were created were the, exactly the kind of jobs we need. Uh, they're jobs that sort of the average citizen could hold, but they were well paying. About two times the average job, uh, you know, uh, 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 compensation you know, in, in the economy. Uh, every household got uh, a, a bonus, <laughs> you know, lower energy costs. Um, and uh, that, that's only gotten more substantial as the prices have gone down. Obviously, the, some of the job retrenchment we've given back, some of the you know, GDP retrenchment, you know, uh, so GDP growth we've, we've been given back, but we're still way, way ahead of where we started. And this is a long-term advantage, so you know, the cycles will happen, but, but this will just only get bigger over the long term. This had a profound effect on our, our uh, government budgets in terms of bringing in revenue that, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, uh, this had a tremendous impact on our need to import energy. And the only unfortunate thing about that is we imported a lot of it from you. 
So I think we're still importing a lot of it for you because it's efficient for us to import from you, but a lot of the imports from you know, far off weird places that are funky and dangerous have been cut back dramatically. Um, we've reduced our vulnerability as a society to a lot of discontinuities in the world that we used to worry deeply about. And, uh, and, and the other remarkable thing that's happened is now America can help other countries address their climate problem. So the first LNG tanker left the port about three weeks ago. Uh, in this case, to go to Europe. And Europeans are just dying to not have to buy natural gas from Russia. Because Russia's a bully. And Russia's been extorting them and threatening them. Okay. And so all of a sudden, we have a new opportunity for supplying natural gas to help people uh, operate uh, a, you know, quite efficient economies. Um, and you have the same opportunity in Canada. Uh, Canada now can help solve China's pollution problem, can help bring down uh, you know, carbon emissions in, in China uh, and other locations. So, so this, this is not just a kind of narrow in, insider kind of an economic uh, benefit and, and a, a global geopolitical benefit. It, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So all this is good. Uh, I think what we also need to know is that in terms of the impact of uh, this low cost energy on the economy, uh, we were just getting started before it got interrupted by this price downturn. Um, and as you see, there's a lot of downstream opportunities. Most of the opportunity so far has been in the upstream, in the actual production and movement of the resource uh, you know, to the market, wherever that is. But, but when you have really low cost uh, uh, gas and, and low cost energy, you start to affect downstream industries. So the petrochemical industry has been coming back in America that had left a long time ago. The plastics industry has coming back to America that had left a long time ago. In a lot of energy intensive goods and ser uh, services that we, you know, we no longer, we, we, we couldn't compete, we're now competitive. Uh, there's, there's a pause now because of the uncertainty of, again, when's, when's the price going to come back, but just a matter of time. The fundamental underlying competitive advantages are, are there. All this is good. So why were we so concerned? Well, the answer is that we've been having a war <laughs> about this incredible economic act, uh, opportunity. A war among ourselves uh, in America. Uh, this is just some of the, you know, evolution of, of public opinion about fracking. In America, fracking is kind of a square word. It's a swear word. This is the biggest economic opportunity we've seen in a long time, but the core technology is a swear word. That's the way it's being portrayed. Um, not only that, and that's because there are a lot of local environmental concerns about, you know, does this cause earthquakes, does it pollute the water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, there has been a tremendous debate about climate. Is this energy opportunity that we have, is our low cost energy resource you know, really bad or inconsistent or incompatible with climate change and, and our response to climate change? And many have taken the point of view, yes, you know, fossil fuel is just bad. And we're going to do everything we can to stop it, all of it. Uh, and we've had a lot of efforts. You know, a lot of this pipeline stuff that goes on is really not about pipeline. It's about fossil fuel. And pipeline is the most pragmatic way to stop the bus on, on fossil fuel. And uh, they, you know, there have been lots of bans, of, of, of production bans in, in, in a variety of places like New York State. So here we have this juxtaposition of a tremendous economic opportunity in, a, in an economy that desperately needs greater opportunities for improving the standard of living for the average citizen. And yet, we have this war 
this extreme polarization. And uh, what's, what's been playing itself out in the US is a truly um, unproductive discourse. You know, we've had industries sort of in denial. Oh, the, the environmentalist says, well, you know, you know, you're causing earthquakes. And the industry says, no, no, that's not us. Uh, environmentalists say, well, there's water pollution issues or, or, or water, water use issues. And the industry says, oh, no, there's no evidence that that's a problem. So we've kind of had industry has sort of been in denial. A lot of people in the industry have viewed this as kind of a mortal threat. That is, this is going to put us out of business. That's the way we look at it. Uh, has that got us anywhere? Not really. No business that's at war with its communities and with ultimately its customers ever wins. But we've had that war. From the environmental point of view, I think there's been a very strong tendency to point out problems. And as we'll talk later, they're real problems. But to find the most newsworthy example and make that seem like the norm or the inevitable outcome. Uh, there's, there's sort of been this doomsday view coming out of the environmental economy, uh, environmentalist community, who many of whom do amazing work. But the way the environmentalist community has chosen to approach this issue has very much been you know, going to the extreme. Oh, this is poisoning everybody in, in, in the community because it's ruining the water supply. Even though a recent EPA report, and you know, they're not necessarily pro-business, just came out and said, well, the water issues are not so bad. And by the way, we can fix them. The ones that exist are pretty easy to fix. Uh, but, but instead of having that discussion about, well, what, what are the issues and how do we fix them, we've had this very extreme, very polarized discussion where it's the good guys versus the bad guys. Uh, in terms of the climate change issue, it's been a similar dialogue. Uh, um, it's been almost a religious war. Uh, and the people that believed and didn't believe were kind of different camps and, um, and there's been a battle over the science and, and, and opposition to any steps to regulate uh, you know, carbon emissions in our, in our economy because people saw that as a threat to their fundamental vita viability in the future, okay? Now, the question I think we all ought to ponder at this point is, did this work so far? Did this actually allow us to get anywhere? And the answer is no. This is a total disaster. Nobody won here. Industry ended up alienating <laughs> some of their most important constituencies and, and wasting time in actually dealing with real issues. Environmentalists, uh, you know, kind of became, uh, created, created a kind of a, a, an enemy relationship uh, with industry when industry was actually critical to actually g achieving what they wanted which is improving environmental impact. And, and on climate, uh, you know, we still have a, a war about climate. So all this rhetoric and all this, all this way of approaching it didn't work. If, if the goal of, of people that care about climate is to get progress towards dealing with climate, it didn't work. We did have uh, the Clean Power Plan uh, uh, put out by the uh, uh, administration uh, some uh, months ago, but of course, as you probably all know, uh, that was immediately challenged by some of the states. Uh, ironically, it was the coal states. We still have people arguing for coal. And yet coal is economically uncompetitive. It's gone. Uh, it's a dinosaur from an economic point of view, much less an environmental point of view. So. So uh, we, I think, we, we, I think th this is our story, and, and I want to kind of just kind of get everybody to focus on this isn't the way to do it. <laughs> if what you really want to do is create progress in your society, 
and move along this great energy transformation. How do we, how do we, how do, we do it better? Well, the basis of our work was, you know, how do we go forward in a way that will change the trajectory and the, and the dialogue that we've had historically? And, and, and we concluded that, you know, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to acknowledge the issues. You know, there really are local environmental concerns, you know, with fracking. And they're real. They're absolutely real. Um, and, you know, denying them is like ludicrous. Instead, we got to measure them and understand them and figure out what to do about them. Uh, and there's a lot of them. There's water issues, there's congestion issues, there's air pollution issues, there's methane. Methane turns out to be a really big issue because methane is a very, very concentrated, you know, greenhouse gas that has a disproportionate effect uh, on, on climate issues. And methane leakage is, is therefore a big problem. Um, uh, so we, we've, we've got to acknowledge these issues if we're going to make any progress. And that applies to climate as well. We've got, we got to acknowledge the issue. In America, just like in Canada, the public has voted. The public believes that we need to do something about climate change, overwhelmingly. And the longer we don't, the, the, the less credibility and the less respect and the less support that the industry will have uh, you know, forever. Um, you know, second thing uh, we have come to understand, though, is despite the fact that there are legitimate problems and, and that we can measure them and track them and look at them, there's been a huge amount of progress. You know, some of you that know my environmental work uh, know that one of the core ideas that came out of that work was the idea that actually improving environmental performance isn't inconsistent with improving economic performance. Actually, those two are most often lockstep because most environmental problems are a sign of poor technology. They're a sign of poor processes, poor methods, poor ways of doing things. Uh, and, and they cry out for innovation and better solutions. And as we track the history of environmental impact by, uh, uh, with unconventional energy and fracking, we see that same pattern. We see that there's been now huge progress all across America in, in many of the states, uh, massive improvements in, in all the things that we care about. Water use, tracking uh, you know, the chemicals, uh, there's no evidence that the chemicals are causing a problem, but we ought to be tracking them and looking at what they are so that we can, you know, kind of measure that over time. We've got all kinds of, of innovation going on in terms of improving the regulatory environment, doing a better job on compliance, making sure that we deal with the, the smaller companies are the ones that tend to do most of the violations in, in our country. And there's been a, you know, kind of a weak enforcement regime and a compliance regime, but that's getting rapidly uh, better. Uh, we've got these continuous improvement bodies now that have formed business government continuous improvement that are really working hard on, on all, these, all these impacts. A lot of progress. We've been through this sort of death-defying price reduction in energy. And you know what happened to environmental performance? Got better. Because again, people were under so much pressure to deal with cost and get the cost down that the environmental improvements, which tend to bring costs down, have accelerated. So what, what an opportunity we have. That innovation has just started. We, we, can, we can figure out a lot better ideas for how to deal with virtually all of these problems, including methane, where again, there's a lot of progress. And what we've learned is that envi the environmental improvements to uh, minimize the local environmental impact are actually not very costly. In fact, they can be free. <laughs> because the economic benefits you get are greater than the cost of reducing this emission. Or So for example, if, if you don't need to use as much water in the drilling process. Or you can recycle that water, you actually save money. 
that's a classic example of how environment and economy kind of can fit together in, in a mutually reinforcing way, and we're learning that. So, uh, you know, uh, what we found is that, you know, if we, if we can just think objectively and pragmatically uh, with data about these issues, we can actually make a lot of progress in improving significantly the economic performance without actually having a major unbearable cost to industry. You know, think about that. You know, industry fought every single regulation and every, even the idea that fracking was a problem for year after year after year. And it turned out that actually the environmental impacts were, uh, uh, you know, kind of accretive if they could improve their environmental performance. What a waste. What a disaster when a society gets into this kind of a dialogue about an issue of this importance. Uh, uh, what a waste. And of course, where I'm getting is, where's Canada? <laughs> you know, what kind of dialogue are you having? Are you moving in the right direction? And, and I'll, I have some thoughts about that that I will share with you in a, in a moment. On climate, uh, it's been an equally fractious debate. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think there, there's still in our country this denial, you know, oh, don't, don't believe it. Science isn't rigorous and so forth. Okay. I think, I think what's happened in the industry is that used to be the stance. We can't even acknowledge this issue because if we acknowledge this issue, there's a slippery slope and our business is gone. Uh, but it turns out that I think a lot of business, businesses in the energy space are starting to understand that's not the way to approach it. Uh, we, 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 can, we, we, we can move this on in a very different way. Part of the problem on climate is there's been some myths about the relationship between climate and economics. Uh, you know, myth number one, that, that if we put in climate legislation, that will kill off the unconventional energy. Um, and the answer is, actually it won't. Um, we actually need natural gas in particular to implement the climate legislation. If we really want to move the needle over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to need gas in particular. Gas is really a strategic resource in climate improvement. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, for natural gas, at least in America, based on our data, 70% of all the natural gas isn't even is not used for power. You know, it's used to make plastics and other stuff. It's a feedstock. Uh, and the feedstock uses are not environmentally um, an issue at all. So the idea that we should, you know, kind of try to, uh, you know, that unconventionals will go away is simply not right. Myth number two, uh, if, we, if we do anything to mitigate climate change, it's going to tank our economy and make us uncompetitive. Well, that's not true either. And we've got a lot of data that you can read about in our report that show that actually because we have the natural gas as a bridge and because we have the very competitive energy resource opportunity that I talked about earlier, we can actually move along the climate agenda very, very uh, substantially uh, at really no extra cost <laughs> because we have that unconventional resource and because we have that low cost position. Unlike a Germany that has no gas uh, and has made this massive commitment to uh, renewables, uh, but in order to move their uh, uh, renewable uh, ratios ahead, uh, they've had to massively increase the cost in their economy. You know, the typical German business has a dramatic higher energy costs now. The average household in Germany has a dramatically higher energy cost. Now, they are willing to tolerate that, but they don't need to. A different strategy could have produced a very different result. And of course, the irony in Germany is they're burning more coal now. 
in, in, in the process. Now, partly they had a nuclear issue and they, they decided they wanted to get out of that as well. But uh, the point is that if you try to move the uh, climate uh, agenda forward without taking advantage of kind of the smart tools you have at your disposal and a realistic understanding of the transition and the timeline that what needs to happen in order to make the climate agenda real and feasible and not prohibitively expensive, you, you end up uh, really punishing your, your economic opportunity. Uh, myth number three is that somehow unconventionals will kill off renewables. We hear this a lot. If we develop this natural gas, this fossil fuel stuff, then that's going to stop renewables in their tracks. Well, again, the answer is no, it won't. If you look at the real data on renewables, renewables are on a very positive trajectory. Renewables are more competitive today than we thought they would be even two or three years ago. Really competitive. The lines are going to cross. They, it's just a matter of time and it's not a long time. Renewables are making rapid advances in fundamental efficiency. In fact, in the long run, they will be the efficient energy source. There'll be no trade-off with efficiency to go to renewables at all. Now, to get there, it's, you know, we're still on that path. The, trouble, the, the challenge with renewables is they, you know, the sun doesn't shine all day and the wind doesn't blow all the time. And different regions have different resources. And so that creates a complexity about renewables that I think many people don't understand. And uh, the requirements for a whole new grid infrastructure and all kinds of policies that need to be in place and, um, and, and the need for standby power so that when you have low production uh, on the renewable side, you can actually uh, you know, not have to turn the lights off. Uh, and we know how to do that, but we know it's a substantial multi-billion dollar kind of investment that's going to take us you know, years, if not decades, to get done. Uh, so we, we don't, shouldn't worry about renewables. We ought, to, we ought to keep the incentives in place for renewables. We ought to keep, keep pushing, uh, but they're on a good path. They're gaining share. Uh, uh, and our job is to kind of make that transition feasible and practical. Uh, and then the final myth is that is the so-called lock-in effect. If we allow even one fossil fuel power plant to be built, even if it's gas, then that fossil fuel plant will be around forever and we'll never get rid of that stuff. That's another argument that we hear a lot. And again, that's, that's very easy to think if you're never worked in a company and you don't understand useful life and you don't understand how uh, you know, uh, uh, cycles of proper, uh, plant replacement work. But if you actually do the math, which uh, with the help of BCG and, and, and Greg, we've done, it turns out that w it, you know, once renewables get to a substantial penetration there'll be plenty of gas-fired power plants that will be ready for retirement. Uh, and there really is no lock-in. And uh, so uh, you can see how this like, epically important discussion for society on climate, you can see how much of a failure this discussion has been as well. In terms of real solutions, in terms of really understanding how to go forward, in terms of getting all the actors doing everything they can do to, 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 to make this better and, and to move it forward and to innovate, uh, we've had a very, very, very unsatisfactory discussion. As a result, we're still having too much of a war in our country. Now, I sense that you're doing better here, uh, but, uh, and we envy you for doing better. We are now starting to have signs of a pivot point in America on this issue. This is just a quote by our EPA administrator who's kind of understanding how the, uh, the unconventional and the uh, climate and the environmental improvements we're all looking for can, can be synergistic and work together. Uh, we're seeing more comments like this. Um, uh, we're also starting to see what the strategy needs to be. And what we laid out in our report is, is what we call a win-win strategy. How can we 
capture the economic opt uh, opportunity, have economic vitality, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, do that in a way that has minimum impact on the local environment and speeds up the transition to a low carbon future. And we don't see those as incompatible uh, with the right strategy. And this is just some of the key pieces of that. You know, some of our companies now are really becoming much more proactive. They're out talking to communities. They're providing education. They're being transparent. They're innovating on minimizing their environmental impact. Uh, we, we see a kind of a, a turning point forming in industry, even at this time of great stress, you know, in, in the energy industry in, in North America. Uh, we see uh, the, some of the environmentalist discussion improving. Uh, we see people now starting to work on solutions. But it took a long, long time. We spent a long time avoiding solutions <laughs> and avoiding pragmatism and avoiding kind of how do we move forward. Uh, and now I think there's some hope that we're in the, uh, in the, in the in, in a, in a pivot point uh, opportunity. Uh, the energy transformation is happening. We will move to a low carbon future. There's no doubt about that. Renewables will be competitive. <laughs> There's no doubt about that now. Natural gas is a critical bridge fuel and an important potential competitive advantage to economies that have it at low cost in abundance. Uh, we know that. And, and this is something that, again, many have trouble accepting, and for certain segments of the energy space, we're going to need fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, for running airplanes, for example. Uh, there's just no way to get enough power, you know, uh, without fossil fuels that anybody's seen so far. Now, somebody may invent a way around that, but, but we're going to have to understand that niches of fossil fuels in carefully uh, understood applications where that is so much more cost effective than any other way to do it are fine as long as we make uh, good progress on the broader agenda. Now, then now, now I think the time is come when I think I want to ask you the question in your mind anyway to think about is what's the path that Canada is on here? You're part of this, you're part of this revolutionary opportunity. You know, Canada has these unique assets. And so there's really this North American advantage in energy. What will Canada's story be about how to move forward in taking advantage of this opportunity, but also recognizing the profound issues that we understand about climate. Uh, you know, will Canada spend the next 10 years like we did? Um, not getting anywhere? Uh, or will Canada be able to move this forward? And what's very, very exciting for me being here is I think you are already on a different path. And I'm hopeful that you could really get on a different path. And that you can lead us and establish a remarkable new reputation around the world <laughs> in this area. Okay. To get there, I think we have to all agree in Canada on a couple of fundamental kind of strategic premises. Number one, we have to understand that energy is a crucial enabler of economic growth and standard of living. We don't want to trash our economy. Canada's economy could grow faster. We need more jobs. You know, Canada's not an economic machine that can afford to sacrifice you know, huge economic uh, uh, impacts unless it is absolutely necessary. And we don't think it's necessary. Uh, second kind of strategic premise, uh, energy is a crucial Canadian competitive advantage. I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't done the study, but it may be the biggest potential competitive advantage that this country 
uh, faces as well. We need to nurture this advantage. We need to find a way to, to turn it into something powerful for the country, again, while recognizing the fundamental transition to low carbon energy that we are in. You know, how, how, do we, how do we put those things together? Uh, number three, I think in Canada it's now quite abundantly clear to me that the public has voted. The public doesn't want to trash the economy and lose all their jobs. But the public is clear we need to deal with climate. We need to be a leader here. Uh, and business needs to get on the bus. Uh, the public has voted. Uh, business needs to get on this bus. Now that doesn't mean we just forget about cost and we just do anything we have to do and you know we, we don't think about pragmatism and we don't think about efficiency and we don't think about it. It doesn't mean that. It just means that we've got to get on this bus. We've got to start solving this problem. Uh, fourth kind of strategic premise for Canada that I would put forward is that the transition to clean energy is feasible while uh, protecting and even enabling a, a robust economy in this country. In fact, we may be able to improve the economy in this process if we're, if we're clever and if we're thoughtful and if we are innovation minded. Uh, number five, I would say a Canada needs to get on the path of really focusing mostly on significantly mitigating the climate impacts of energy and accelerating the shift towards renewable. In order to do that, I think we need to get rid of all the, the coal-fired plants, take much more advantage of the natural gas resource that exists here. We need to put the pipelines in place to allow us to move stuff around to be efficient from a climate point of view and economically as well. Uh, we need to use gas in Canada not just for uh, uh, exports and, and power generation, but we need to use the gas like we are using it in the U.S. to expand our economic footprint, to be competitive in industries that we never could be competitive in before that actually don't have environmental issues, uh, like, like plastics, for example. Um, uh, number, number four, we need to start exporting our gas. Uh, you know, Canada can solve climate problems around the world, in China and elsewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that is a, a, a great opportunity for this country. Uh, we've tended to think of exporting our energy south to the U.S. The U.S. is now much more competitive. We need to find new markets. Uh, and, and, and as long as we do that in, in a very environmentally friendly way in terms of impacts and leaks and spills and all the things we worry about, which we can do, we know how to do that, uh, uh, this is a huge opportunity. So let's get on with this. Let's not think that exporting LNG to China is somehow going to be bad for the climate. It's going to be good for climate, uh, both here and, and elsewhere. Uh, we need to develop renewables <laughs> as fast as we can. And, and I've been very pleased as I circulate the halls at this Globe Forum that's going on right now to see all that kind of people innovating and you know excited about their company and their idea and their new way of doing solar uh, cells and you know their no, new toolkits for uh, bringing down this methane issue or whatever it is. So there's a lot of innovation in Canada. And I think you have an opportunity to be, if, again, you're constructive and focused on solutions, you have an opportunity to be a real innovation center in this field. The U.S. does too, but there's no reason why Canada can't uh, be one of the places in the world that we think about when we think about countries that are actually uh, improving environmental impacts and making steady progress uh, on climate and substantial progress and creating the technologies to do that. That's a little bit of a view. We tend to be a resource exporter here, uh, but I think we, we can be much more than that in this field because of our very, very unique uh, potential position. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that we develop our energy resources, both our legacy ones like the oil sands, 
but especially our new unconventional ones, we, we develop those resources and, 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 and in a very innovative, environmentally leading way. And, and there, I think there's some good stuff happening in terms of the COSIA partnership uh, that is really bringing down significantly the economic impacts of, of the oil sands. Uh, and I think the technology here uh, around renewables extraction and, and uh, development is uh, uh, really world-class, uh, way above everybody, anybody else except potentially the, the US. Uh, and we've got to make sure that everything we do, pipelines, all of our, our energy extraction and move, movement facilities in this country are at the state of the art. And that we expect that and we put the right regulatory framework in place in order to get that done. Uh, and I think we're off to a, a good start. I think the final strategic premise that I would put forth uh, to you uh, at, is that there's one thing we've learned from the US story. <clears throat> what we've learned is that polarization doesn't work. It gets us nowhere. It's a cop out. It's being lazy. Uh, it's not about solutions, it's not about progress, it's not about innovation, it's not about how do we actually work together and do things. And what I hope for you and wish for you is that the seeds that I already see here, having been here now for the last you know, 30 hours and talked to many, many people in the energy space, is that that era of polarization hopefully is, is evolving towards an era of collaboration and innovation. And uh, if that is absolutely, it's actually true, I think that Canada will become really one of the leading countries in the world in both energy, uh, environmental improvement, and climate change. And I think that will make your competitive advantage in energy even bigger uh, than it is today. So thank you for your uh, attention today. This is uh, a, a, a large body of work that I've tried to summarize relatively quickly. Uh, I welcome any questions. I'm sure that there are people in the room who uh, will be upset by something I said. That's, that's the nature of this beast. That's OK. Uh, but I hope that uh, we can now have a discussion and a dialogue that, that's really about the, the future, uh, where we go, and how to create solutions. Thank you very much.